Well, good morning, church. My name is Graham Bowen, and I get to be the student director here at 938. And like many of you, I am wondering, why'd they give me the microphone for more than a few minutes today? And regardless of the answer to that, it is a joy and honor for me to get to share God's word and learn alongside you this morning. There is no such thing as a free lunch. This is an adage I'm sure many of us are familiar with, but one I was not privy to until my junior year of high school, where in economics class with the legendary Mr. Fish, he explained the, this simple phrase to describe a simple reality in our society. Everything comes with a cost. Everything has fine print or a catch or hidden fees. It's the world we live in. And what's the result of this? Yes, maybe more profit for a large company, but for us, cynicism, skepticism, doubt, a need for money. It makes it more and more difficult to believe that something, let alone something good in this world, would be offered for free. So to depict this, I'd like to share a story from the book, God for the Rest of Us. And the gentleman who writes the introduction is a pastor, and his name is Kyle Eidemann. And he speaks from his experience and touches on this exact concept. So he says, a few years ago, I went to the home of an older couple who were interested in becoming part of the church he pastors. Neither of them had grown up in church, and they had only attended services where I preach a few times. And they had a few questions. And with complete sincerity and a spirit of humility, the wife asked, is there an application I need to fill out to be a member of your church? Before I had a chance to respond, her husband jumped in and asked a question with a little more cynicism. What I want to know is, how much does it cost? I, they assumed there was an application process and a price tag for being part of the church. And I quickly explained to them that they didn't have to pass a test and that being a Christian and a part of the church was free of financial cost. I talked to them about the love of God and his gift of grace through Jesus Christ, but they were both skeptical. It seemed too good to be true. And they were convinced that there was some fine print they weren't being told about. As a pastor, I regularly talk to people who don't think their application for God's love and grace will be approved. It may be a great deal for some people, but not for them. They know their own histories, they have ideas about their value and worth, and they feel certain they won't qualify. How many of us wonder if our application for God's love, grace, and acceptance won't be approved? That there might be some hesitancy from God as he offers us this invitation into a life that's brand new and where he is made up for our past, present, and future sin. Because we know our own histories and we know the atrocities of mind and heart and body that we've committed, and we can't help but wonder, am I too bad to be accepted? I know the dark and twisted places my own mind wanders, and uh, it makes me want to run from the knowing and loving eyes of Jesus, and I know the challenge of believing that God loves me and wants to do a good work in and through me. But right now, just like the title of this book, we're in a series called God for the Rest of Us. And we're looking at how God specifically reaches out to and connects with those of us who might never expect him to. How he's a God for all people and who cares for all people. What kind of a God would do that? So the story we're going to read today shows us that no matter how many places or things we've looked to for life that ultimately lead us to feel thirstier and emptier than we did before, Jesus still does not disregard him, disregard us in his offer for true satisfaction. I think most of us know the feeling of nervous anticipation as we await the answer to an application or um, when we're waiting to get in for a job or a school or maybe a friend group. And I think many of us know what it's like to say to ourselves, I'm not good enough or right now I'm just not ready for God. And I could almost guarantee the woman in this story feels similar. 
She knows her own social and relational history, and she knows the odds going against her when it comes to experiencing God. But this God, as we'll see through Jesus, is a God for the outsider, the despised, and yes, the rest of us. So we're going to be looking at John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. It's in the New Testament, and we're going to be starting from verse 1. You can also follow along on the screens. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So I'm going to pause right there because this is setting the scene for the entire story. So we're reading that Jesus and his disciples, they've got a great business going. This startup, this movement they began is reaching hundreds, if not thousands. Lives are being changed. People are being baptized. He's seeing more success than the spiritual leaders prior to him. But what does he do? He says, yeah, time to move on. Time to go to a new place. He leaves. And he goes to a place that's seen as out of the way, less politically strategic, and certainly not as highly regarded as Judea, which is where the holy city of Jerusalem is. And if we have a map, we can, we're going to throw that up so we can get an idea of the context here. On his way, you'll see the two green regions are divided by a region called Samaria. And traditionally, people would actually cross the river to go up and around Samaria to get to Galilee. But it says he had to go through Samaria. And, and this was a choice he made. Samaria was a region known for their um, departure from the Jewish customs. And it was constantly at an unbelievably high so social and racial tension between its neighbors to the north and the south. So why does he do this? Yes, it is more direct, but that was easily surpassed by many others at that time. No, Jesus is not willy-nilly in his decision-making, but there is someone that he wants to meet. And that someone is an outsider of the outsiders. And we're going to see how this interaction plays out. So we're going to pick up in verse 5. So he, Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. These are two major players in the Old Testament. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as, also, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Today we're going to see how, like the woman, we look for life in places that seem reasonable, but that cannot truly sustain us. Jesus meets us and shows us his offer for a different way of living, a truly satisfying way. And the first way we see this play out is through our expectations of him. See, Jesus may not look like the things that we often put our hope in, but it doesn't mean he can't be the one to find our hope in. If this woman was going to fill out an application for redemption, how would it look? Certainly not great to the political and religious leaders of that time, not with her social history and experience. And this is an assumption that she operates out of throughout her conversation with Jesus. She's thinking, I'm, I'm not going to fit in. I'm not going to fit the bill. In verse 11, we see the woman respond to Jesus out of her understanding of where water and life come from. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you, give, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? She's very literal and probably on the defensive. She's trying to shake this guy from asking any further prodding questions. How often do we respond to Jesus out of the context of our own understanding? It makes sense too. It's how we understand the world around us. Is it because we find ourselves uncomfortable with the questions he asks us? Or perhaps we don't really like the answers to the questions he asks us. Often we become defensive and we're ready to shift the topic of discussion in an instant. In this passage, Jesus alludes to offering the woman life via his living water. So let's use this imagery of life as an example. In our modern Western world, we know that life comes via reproduction, which we understand through science. And life is supported through food and water. And to it, attain that food and water, we understand we need resources. So what does that prompt us to do? We look for resources to acquire these things. And chances are, if you're sitting here, if you're watching online, in reality, you have everything you need for life. Yet we find ourselves, many of us, still wondering, there's got to be more to it. We search for life, and we search for a deeper experience in things like wealth, relationships, influence and power, adrenaline rushes, hobbies, vacations, role models, or lifestyle brands. And each one of these things in and of themselves is not bad. But what do they do? They offer us a taste of what deep down we know life should be like. But any one of these things, when on their own, will fall short, and they won't last. Jesus wants us to take a step deeper he wants us to look at him and see what he offers, that there is so much more to life than the things that fade away. He wants us to know that life, true and satisfying life, is found through a relationship with God the Father. And this life, contrary to the former list, offers a sense of belonging, a freedom from sin, guilt, and shame, real friendship, the experience of loving others sacrificially and being loved, true peace, and faith in God and knowing that when we ask for his will to be done, it, that we believe it's the best thing. And these things are set apart from the rest because they last, they're eternal, and they bring God glory here and now as well as beyond. I'll tell you in my own life, I've looked for meaning in a lot of relationships. I had a best friend in elementary school named Zach and we sat on the bus next to each other every day and it was awesome. And I thought we will easily be best friends through middle school and high school. And probably be neighbors someday. Well, 
middle school rolled around and we lost touch and went our separate ways. And a girl I dated in my teens, same thing. I thought, this is, this is the one. She's going to be in my life forever. And, and clue you in, she is not the amazing woman I'm married to now. None of these, neither of these people are bad or terrible or have done wrong things, but they're human. They fail, they fall away, we lose touch, and ultimately, they won't remain with me forever. And they don't offer me the things I need or crave in life. And just like me, they're human. So where does that point us? Back to Jesus. Ironically, who's a human, but who's also fully God. The best thing about this is that he has already paved the way into our relationship with God through his death and resurrection. And daily, he continues to invite us into this, knowing that us taking that next step is the only thing that will offer us true and fulfillment to the constant cravings of our heart. So we expect Jesus to offer life through the things that we're familiar with, but we need to check our expectations of Jesus against our own limited perspectives. So let's turn our attention to the kinds of people that Jesus reveals himself to and what that means for us here and now. We see a few different times in the story that Jesus goes against our expectations of how he should act or just who he is. One of the first being of when he even opens his mouth to speak with this woman. At that time and in this culture, that would have been a huge no-no. Right? Men rarely talk to women to the extent that husbands would barely speak to their wives uh, unless in the privacy of their own home. So we are in a culture here that takes social dynamics to the extreme. And Jesus strikes up a, hey, how are you? With this woman who's a woman, who's a woman with a scandalous unknown social history and who's from one of the most hated regions of that time. And we see the woman's mixed reaction of shock and disgust when Jesus speaks with her and actually asks her for a favor. And she responds with, uh, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. She, she calls out their most notable differences right away. She says, how can you ask me for a drink? Pretty simple favor, but one that would be offensive. And Jesus responds in a way that seems unrelated and unexpected. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He just finished speaking publicly and baptizing hundreds, if not thousands, all in one city. Yet while he was there, he didn't reveal himself as the Messiah or someone who could offer life like this. He waits until he is in this despised region in the middle of nowhere by a well with a woman. And he goes on to reveal himself as the true giver of life, as the Messiah, the Christ. So if Jesus reveals himself and fairly early on in the conversation to this woman, I think he could reveal himself to you and to me, regardless of how far we think we are from God. See, we so often get stuck in how we think or foresee things should play out that we can miss the very ways that God shows up directly in front of us. It often begins by us thinking to ourselves, you know, Jesus or God, if you exist, you're, you're perfect and you've got your life and act together anyways. And besides, you're up there and I'm down here, so you don't really know what it's like. And, and I'm still trying to figure things out. Um, I might be lost or... Maybe I'm struggling with that thing that I, I said I was going to kick a few years ago. But over time, we count ourselves out. And, and we begin to think of how preposterous it would be for Jesus to even be interested in us. And as we follow this mindset, slowly but surely, disbelief sets in. So in a matter of seconds, we draw from our own experiences. And we make a judgment call on a situation, just like this woman did. In this moment, we see that Jesus wants so badly for us to wake up to who he is and what he really has to offer us. And if I could use a phrase that some of us might be familiar with, it's the idea of a growth mindset. 
Jesus desires that we might not find ourselves fixed in the thing that we've begun to believe and have always believed and said to ourselves, we're always going to believe this. He wants us to think, wow, maybe my worldview or my beliefs aren't fully complete yet. Maybe there's still room for growth or development. This woman is about to experience truth that will change her entire outlook on life, but she's already bought into a different storyline. A while back, I was talking with a friend who shared with me that any time he enters into a conversation with somebody who he has a pretty good idea, they share a different set of beliefs or opinion than he does, he likes to remind himself that what he cares about is truth and finding out the truth. And, and maybe this person knows something that's true that I don't yet. And in our context, truth comes back to the person of Jesus, and, and that's the the definition of truth that I operate out of. But he said to me, this, this idea of pursuing truth offers them a ground for a respectful but open-minded conversation where they get to share and learn from each other. And I, I love this so much, and, and I found myself re- remembering this often when I was doing campus ministry, particularly when I had the chance to go overseas to the Middle East for a summer. Because while we were there, one of our goals was to just engage in spiritual conversations with college students. And you'll see a couple pictures from my time there. And instead of just waking up in the morning and believing that most of the people, who, by the way, 99.9% of them are are Muslim, and instead of believing and assuming that everything they were going to share with me was just wrong, I thought, what if they have something true to share with me, what, what could I stand to learn? And as I embraced this mindset, I ended up hearing some really cool stories and ended up seeing that these young men and women aren't really that much different than me. While there, I was reminded that regardless of our religion or our upbringing or the culture we lived in, Each one of us faces the experience of humanity. We're all struggling with this idea that we're broken or still searching or longing for life or a better life than we know it. And many of us, I would argue all of us, want a way out. We want a savior. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us desire the final puzzle piece to bridge that gap between where we are now and where we know we could be. So these words of encouragement and and, uh, open-minded idea from my friend has stuck with me. And they've allowed me to enter into these conversations and they've encouraged me in my own walk with Jesus as I sit down to either pray or read the Bible and try to put myself in a mindset of wanting to learn from him, I think, How can I be open and how can I be compassionate to what he might ask of me? Because in the end, he knows he is a God for the rest of us. But are we willing to believe that for ourselves? So before we close today, I want to share a scene from the TV series, The Chosen. And if, uh, if you're unfamiliar, I would highly suggest you take a few minutes this week to check out some of their content They do well to depict stories from the New Testament in uh, a high quality production, but that also maintain a high level of accuracy to the scriptures and to history. So we're going to take a look at the scene specifically where Jesus interacts with this woman. So let's play that. Would you give me a drink? Hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask her to drink from me a Samaritan and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come with you in the heat. You have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? 
long story. I, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Wrong story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband, then come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him, even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes, it explains everything and sort this mess out, including me. I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married, but he wasn't a good man. He hurt you, and it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am 
rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temple. Soon. Just the heart. You promise. I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> You forgot your um. Talk to your man. You told me everything. I ever did. <laughs> um, Rabbi, we got food. What would you like? Ah, uh, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Who got you food? When Jesus turns to you and looks you in the eyes and he says, I am he, how do you respond? Do your walls of defenses shoot up to ward off the discomfort or pain? Or do you allow yourself to be truly and fully known and accepted no matter your past. Either way, Jesus' end goal is not to disqualify you. It's to offer you what he knows will truly give you life, a personal knowledge and relationship with God the Father and a purpose that goes with that to play an active role in his story of redemption. So let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you for the clarity that you offer us to believe that your son Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for giving us a true and trustworthy place to put our hope. We open our hearts and minds and bodies to you in the belief that you offer life and satisfaction through you. We praise you that a time has now come that we may worship you, our Heavenly Father, in the spirit and in truth. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name.